Welcome to lecture 2, section 1.2 of the text Advanced Calculus by Patrick M. Fitzpatrick. We are still on chapter 1, Tools for Analysis, and today we will be dealing with the distribution of integers and the rational numbers. Here are the two key results we will see today. Number 1, the distribution of integers. For any number c, there is a unique integer in the interval c, c plus 1, close at c, and open at c plus 1, i.e., for every c in R, for every number in R, there exists a unique integer n that is in the interval c, c plus 1, the half-closed interval, or you could call it the half-open interval. What do you think about the interval opened at c and closed at c plus 1? How many integers would be in this interval? So that is the first question or the first result that we shall see. And the second result would be the distribution of rational numbers. For any two numbers a and b where a is less than b, there is a rational number in the open interval a, b. That's interesting. We would actually give that a name as we move forward. RE, for any two real numbers A and B, there exists a rational number Q, such that Q is in the open interval AB, and we do not forget that A is strictly less than B. Example, if I take A to be 0 0.001, and I take B to be 0 0.002, then A is strictly less than B, and the second result says that I can always find a rational number Q that sits between A and B in the open interval, as a matter of fact. Can you figure out what such a number could be? Maybe A plus B divided by 2. We shall see. Okay, let's move on to some preliminary results before we get into our main results for today. The first one is subsection 1.2.1, the Archimedean property. The following two equivalent properties hold. So, the statement says, number one, the two properties are equivalent, and number two, the hold. So in our proof, we will prove that these two properties are equivalent, and then we will prove at least one of them and show that actually they do hold. First property, for any positive number C, there is a natural number N such that N is greater than C, i.e., for every C in R where C is greater than 0, there exists a natural number N n such that n is greater than c. Let me use some real examples so we can understand this better. If I pick c, a real number, to be 80008.95, then all I need to do is take my n to be the ceiling of that number, and n is greater than c. If c is an integer itself, just add 1 then n is greater than c. So you can see that no matter how big a positive real number is, I can always find a natural number that is bigger than it. It is pretty straightforward because the set of natural numbers is infinite. But we are in an abstract course, so we would provide a rigorous abstract proof to that very simple concept. Number two. For any positive number epsilon, there is a natural number n such that 1 over n is less than epsilon, i.e., for every epsilon bigger than 0, I can always find a natural number n such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. Again, let me give you a real example so we can use this to kind of internalize the concept. For example, if epsilon is 0 0.000001, that's bigger than 0, I need to find a natural number n such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. Just take n to be 10 to the 7. As a matter of fact, I could have taken n to be 10 to the 6 plus 1. 
and 1 over n is going to be less than epsilon. So it's a very straightforward concept one more time, but again, because we're dealing with an abstract class, we have to provide a very rigorous proof. So let's go ahead and prove this. Firstly, we want to show that both statements are equivalent. Now, let epsilon and c be real numbers, and both are greater than zero, both are positive. If epsilon equals 1 over c, then we would see that n is greater than c if and only if 1 over n is less than 1 over c and 1 over c is epsilon. So n is greater than c if and only if 1 over n is less than epsilon, where n is a natural number. And we can see that that simply means that statements 1 holds if and only if statement 2 holds. In other words, both statements are equivalent. Our choice would be the first statement and we would do that by contradiction. Let's go back and look at the first statement. For any positive number c, there is a natural number n such that n is greater than c. So if I pick a positive number c at random, I should be able to find a natural number n such that n is greater than c. Again, we would prove this by contradiction. Suppose c is a real number, c is greater than zero, but on the contrary, there is no natural number n such that n is greater than c. If there is no natural number n such that n is greater than c, then by the positivity axioms, what we are saying is that for every natural number n, n is going to be less than or equal to c. That is interesting. This happens for every natural number n. So if I pick an n from the set of natural numbers, it is going to be less than or equal to c. Have you seen this before? Yes, that is the definition of a set being bounded above. So that means the set of natural numbers n is bounded above. And by the completeness axiom, we're saying that a set of natural numbers has at least upper bound or has a soup. So call the least upper bound of the set of natural numbers B. Since B is the smallest upper bound, it follows that B minus one half cannot be an upper bound for N. That's just obvious. The smallest upper bound is B. So if I take off anything from B, no matter how small it is, it can no longer be an upper bound. So B minus one half cannot be an upper bound for the set of natural numbers. So N plus one is strictly greater than B minus one half plus one, which is B plus one half, and B plus one half is strictly greater than B. In other words, we have found a natural number n plus 1, which is greater than b. Remember, n is a natural number, so n plus 1 is a natural number because the set of natural numbers is inductive. But that is a huge contradiction right there. We did say that b was the soup, the least upper bound for the set of natural numbers, and now we have found a natural number that is greater than b. That contradicts the maximality of B. So this contradicts the choice of B as an upper bound for the set of natural numbers N. And this contradiction arises because of our assumption that there was no natural number N such that N is greater than C. Therefore, what do we conclude? We do conclude that for every real number C, C greater than zero, I can always find a natural number n such that n is greater than c, and that proves the Archimedean property. Beautiful. The next preliminary result we would see before we get to our two key results for this section is Proposition 1.2.2. It says that for any integer n, there is no integer k in the open interval n, n plus 1. In other words, if I give you the open interval 2, 3, you cannot find an integer in that interval. 
Again, these are straightforward concepts, things you've probably learned from kindergarten, except that you probably haven't yet seen the rigorous proofs for some of these concepts. And being an abstract class would attempt to give some rigorous proofs for some of these straightforward concepts. So, proof. First, consider the case when n equals 0. Remember, we're dealing with integers here, and 0 is an integer. Now, define the set S by S equals the set of all natural numbers k such that k is greater than or equal to 1. Because elements in S are from the set of natural numbers, S is a subset of n. But S has the element 1 and then has every element after 1, so it is an inductive set. And we have seen this before in lecture 1. The set of natural numbers is a subset of every inductive set. So since S is a subset of N and N is a subset of S, it follows that S equals N. So the set we have just defined is the set of natural numbers. So we're simply saying the obvious. For every natural number K, K is greater than or equal to 1. Now, since the set of positive integers Z plus equals the set of natural numbers N, it follows that the open interval 0, 1 does not contain an integer. So we have established the first case, the case when n equals 0. There is no integer in the open interval 0, 1, because that integer would have been a positive integer, and the set of positive integers equals the set of natural numbers which start from 1. So there is no natural number or positive integer in the open interval 0, 1. Okay, now let's keep that result and consider the general integer n, and we shall proceed by contradiction. Suppose there exists an integer k in the open interval n, n plus 1. What does that mean? It means n is strictly less than k, which is less than n plus 1. If I subtract n from both sides, that gives me 0 less than k minus n, which is also less than 1. Interesting. k is an integer. n is an integer. The difference of two integers is an integer. So what are we saying? We have found an integer k minus n, which is an element of the open interval 0, 1. We proved in the first case that this is not possible. Therefore, we have a contradiction which arises from the assumption that n, n plus 1 contains an integer k. Therefore, we can now conclude that for every integer n, the open interval n, n plus 1 does not contain any integers. End of proof. Beautiful. Now, the third preliminary result we would see as we head towards our two key results would be proposition 1.2.3. Suppose that S is a non-empty subset of integers and that it is bounded above. Then we conclude that S has a maximum element, i.e., let S be a non-empty subset of the set of integers such that for every x in S, there exists a real number C such that x is less than or equal to C. That simply means S is bounded above. Then there exists an element M in S such that X is less than or equal to M for every X in S, i.e. M is the maximum element in S. To help us see this easily, let's take S to be this non-empty set of integers 5, 6, 7, right up to 5, 0, 0, 0, 1. Then m equals 5, 0, 0, 0, 1 is the maximum element in S. Again, these are straightforward concepts that deserve some rigorous proofs.
Since S is bounded above by the completeness axiom, S has a least upper bound or a soup. Let the soup be called A. So A is the supremum of S. Now, since A is the smallest upper bound of S, it follows that A minus 1 cannot be an upper bound for S. We've seen this same argument before. Since A is the smallest upper bound for S, anything subtracted from A disqualifies that result from being an upper bound for S. And what that means is I can always find an element M in S such that A minus 1 is less than M. That is because A minus 1 is not an upper bound for S. So I can always find an element M in S that is greater than A minus 1, i.e. A is strictly less than M plus 1. Now, since A is an upper bound for S and A is less than M plus 1, it follows that S is a proper subset of the open interval negative infinity M plus 1. Now, S is a set of integers. M is an integer. And by proposition 1.2.2, the open interval M, M plus 1 contains no members of S because S is a set of integers. Therefore, the set inclusion above is improved to S being a proper subset of the half-closed interval negative infinity M. And do not forget M is an element in S. So, therefore, M is the maximum element of the set S. And we are done. Very straightforward, rigorous, but good. So, if S is a non-empty subset of the set of integers and is bounded above, then it has a maximum element, and the proof centers around the completeness axiom. Okay, now let's get to the first key result. Theorem 1.2.4, the distribution of integers. For any number C, there exists exactly one integer K in the half-closed interval C, C plus 1. You could also call it half opened interval closed at c and opened at c plus one proof let's see be a real number we want to show that there exists exactly one integer k in the half closed interval c c plus one we start by defining the set s to be the set of all integers such that n is less than c plus one we cannot say anything about s without verifying that s is non-empty if C plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, then 0 is an element in S, in which case S is non-empty. If C plus 1 is less than 0, then negative into C plus 1 is greater than 0. And that makes it a positive number. By the Archimedean property, there exists a natural number n such that n is greater than negative into C plus 1. Negative into C plus 1 is a positive number. And that means negative n would be less than c plus 1, and negative n is an integer. That would make negative n an element in S, in which case S is non-empty. So whether c plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, or less than 0, we see that there is an element in S, and we can conclude that S is non-empty. Now we can go ahead and use the set S. By the definition of S, C plus 1 is an upper bound for S. That means S is bounded above. By proposition 1.2.3, S has a maximum element called the maximum element K. Then K is greater than or equal to C. For otherwise, K will be less than C, in which case K plus 1 is less than C plus 1, which would contradict the choice of K as being the largest integer less than c plus 1. Therefore, k is an element of the half-closed interval c, c plus 1, closed at c and opened at c plus 1. And here is our claim. 
Therefore, K is actually an element in the half-closed interval C, C plus 1. Closed at C, open at C plus 1. So we have found an element in the half-closed interval C, C plus 1. And here comes our claim. There is only one integer in that half-closed interval. Let's prove it. Proof of claim. Suppose, on the contrary, there exists k1 and k2 in the half-closed interval c, c plus 1. Without loss of generality, let's say that k1 is less than k2. In that case, k2 minus k1 would be greater than 0. And that is because k1 is less than k2. Now, K1 and K2 are both elements in the half-closed interval C, C plus 1. So what we are saying is that these inequalities here hold. C is less than or equal to K1, which is less than C plus 1. C is less than or equal to K2, which is less than C plus 1. In other words, K2 is less than C plus 1 and K1 is greater than or equal to C, and putting both together, we can conclude that K2 minus K1 is going to be less than C plus 1 minus C, and that equals 1. In other words, K2 minus K1 is an integer because the difference of two integers is an integer that is an element in the open interval 0, 1, which contradicts proposition 1.2.2. Thus, there is exactly one integer in the half-closed interval C, C plus 1, and we are done. Beautiful. Subsection 1.2.5 definition. A set S of real numbers is said to be dense in the set R, provided that for every interval A, B, where A is less than B, I can find an element of S in that interval. So S is dense in R if I can find... So S is dense in R, provided that whenever there is an open interval, no matter how small the open interval is, A, B, where A is less than B, I can always find an element of S in that open interval. Now, our second key result for this section, theorem 1.2.6, the distribution of rational numbers. Very simply stated, the set of rational numbers is dense in R. Q is dense in R. In other words, if I pick any open interval A, B, no matter how small the open interval is, with A less than B, I can always find a rational number in that interval. Interesting. Let's look at the proof. Proof. Let A and B be real numbers, such that A is less than B. We must show that there exists a rational number Q, such that Q is in the open interval A, B. Now, A less than B implies that B minus A is positive, is greater than zero. So by the Archimedean property, there exists a natural number N such that 1 over N is less than B minus A. That means that 1 over N is less than the length of the open interval AB. Let's see be defined as follows. C equals N times B minus 1. Then, by theorem 1.2.4, there exists an integer m, as a matter of fact, unique integer m, in the half-closed interval nb minus 1, nb, i.e., nb minus 1 is less than or equal to m, which is strictly less than n times b. Dividing by n, we have b minus 1 over n less than or equal to m divided by n, which is less than b, and call this equation plus. But since 1 over n is less than b minus a, it follows that a equals b minus b minus 1 will be less than b minus 1 over n, and call that equation plus plus. 
Now use these two inequalities plus and plus plus and we can conclude that the rational number m over n belongs to the interval and we are done. In other words, if I pick two real numbers, a, b, no matter how big or how small they are, where a is less than b, I can always find a rational number in that interval. And that means q, the set of rational numbers, is dense in r. What about qc, the set of irrational numbers? As a matter of fact, subsection 1.2.7 corollary, the set of irrational numbers is dense in R. So not only is Q dense in R, QC is also dense in R, which makes it exciting. So if I pick two real numbers, no matter how small the numbers are, with A less than B, I can always find an irrational number in the open interval. And I can also find a rational number in the same open interval. The density of the irrationals follows from the density of the rationals and the existence of positive irrational numbers. Let's break that down some more. Let A, B be an open interval with A and B real numbers, A less than B. Choose any positive irrational number of your choice. For example, take Z to be square root of 2. You could even take Z to be pi if you want to. Then, by the density of rational numbers, there exists a rational number x in the open interval a divided by z, comma, b divided by z. In other words, x is in this open interval, which interpreted as inequalities would mean that a over z is less than x, which is less than b over z. z is your chosen irrational number. And that means A is less than ZX, which is less than B. Now, the product of an irrational number and a rational number is irrational. You should be able to prove that. If not, try your hand on it. It goes by contradiction. So I've succeeded to find an irrational number ZX in the open interval A and B, where A and B are real numbers and A is less than B. And this concludes my result that a set of irrational numbers is dense in R. And this brings us to the end of section 1.2, the distribution of integers and the distribution of rational numbers. In 1.3, we will look at some inequalities and some identities and then we would proceed into some content of real analysis. Thank you and God bless you.